I'm Jack Staley. I'm uh, chairman of the board of Hospira. I'm going to briefly tell you the story of Hospira and what we're trying to accomplish. Hospira, as Kathy mentioned, is the, is the uh, world's largest provider of injectable drugs and <coughs> infusion technologies. Uh, we have 80, year, 80 plus years of history, but we've only been a public company, separate public company since 2004. Approximately $4 billion in revenue. Uh, we are the market leader in the key businesses that we're in. Uh, we have 16,000 employees around the world, and we sell our products in 90 different countries. There are two major parts to our business, the pharma side and the device side. On the pharma side, our key business is specialty injectable pharmaceuticals, where we're the global leader. Uh, we also we, we do generic injectables. We do proprietary drugs. And we uh, uh, are deeply into biosimilars, which is, uh, for us, a very important part of our future. <clears throat> you do not find our products in a CVS or a Walgreens. All of our products uh, are used in hospitals. On the device side of our business, we have a portfolio of infusion devices that help make medication delivery process safer and more efficient. You would recognize our products in our IV bags and the medical pumps that are used in the hospital. We are driving the future of medication management systems with a holistic system that supports a safer medication process while enabling greater productivity and quality control. The broad line of products we offer are focused on providing solutions for the serious and mounting challenges that healthcare faces today from the needs to reduce costs, medication errors, hospital-inquired infections, many of which we heard about earlier today, to improving patient <coughs> um, and caregiving safe safety. <coughs> Hospira has set two major priorities. Reinforcing our foundation. Uh, let me see if I can get to another. Well, if you could move it a few slides. Reinforcing our foundation, we have made significant investments in our manufacturing sites, which in many cases are quite old, to ensure that we have the highest quality and can produce the quantities that are needed by the market today. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, I did that. Okay. <coughs> and at the same time, a need to turbocharge our growth with new devices and pharmaceutical products, biosimilars, which I mentioned to you earlier, are a sig significant part of our growth. Our industry faces many challenges from industry-wide drug shortages to rapidly changing environmental regulatory environments. We believe that the changes we are making are driving focus throughout the organization on superior quality, which will be in integrally important to making the improvements that were, uh, will be sustainable over a long period of time. In our mind, a quality mindset starts at the very top, not just at the board and not just at senior management, but driven all the way through all of our employees. What did we start to do to achieve this? We first went out and we hired a new head of quality, a new head of regulatory, a new head of operations, a new chief medical officer, and in fact, all of our plant managers in the United States are new. All of these individuals ha had come from the outside and were leaders, not only in their technical expertise, but to do the job with a quality mindset. That was critical to their ch being chosen. <clears throat> this focus on excellence requires a change in culture, and that is what we are driving through the organization. And we have made it very clear in the organization that it is not just the flavor of the month, but it is an initiative that will be sustained. We have put in the appropriate rewards and disincentives for behaviors that we believe are against what we are trying to culturally change and do. And we believe that our cultural transformation is about three things. Changing mindsets so that every Hasperian is focused on flawless ex execution. Two, changing behaviors so that we have identified a set of eight cultural anchors 
that describe our desired cultural behaviors. And three, reinforcing the cultural changes through an aligned leadership team. I'm now going to turn it over to Pam uh, Perrier. Pam is our Vice President of Organizational Development and Talent uh, Persons. Hey, Pam. change and transformation. And it was really interesting for me to listen to the keynote presenter as well as the panel that followed because I think where we ended up is where the rubber meets the road. Someone said it's not just about the data, but it's about what you do with the data and how you change behavior as a result of the data. And that's the challenge that we've been on or trying to address at Hospira is how do we change the mindsets and behaviors of 16,000 employees globally to execute flawlessly, which is our mission. So I know we heard earlier about getting to a culture of transparency. Our cultural journey is about getting to a culture of flawless execution. And as we looked at this, we realized that we had to be very deliberate about it. We had to have a plan. This wasn't something that was gonna happen organically for 16,000 people in over 90 countries at Hospira. And so the plan that we put into place really has five parts. It's multifaceted and we're addressing all five parts really simultaneously, but I'm gonna quickly take you through each of these five facets and share with you a little bit about what we're doing. The first piece, which is so important, is communication. And when I talk about communication in this day of email exchanges, I'm not talking about an email blast that tells 16,000 people, here's the culture that we're aspiring to and here's the five steps that we're gonna take to get there. When I talk about communication, I'm speaking really about an exchange of information where people walk away with a mutual understanding about what it is that we're trying to achieve. Where we're connecting our people, 16,000 people globally, to a particular message around culture. What is it and what is it that we're trying to achieve? What is our vision of the culture at Hospira? I'm talking about connecting them to that message, to educating them around that message, and ultimately really wanting to engage people so that they become a part of the culture transformation at Hospira. So that it's not just something that's happening at the top of the organization, but it's something that's engaging all 16,000 employees. And we were very lucky. Uh, we had a new CEO join us, Mike Ball, about two years ago, and that was our opportunity to really jumpstart this cultural change. Because one of the things that we wanted to do was do this from within. We wanted to have an internally developed, organic approach to culture transformation, and a new leader gives you that great opportunity because they come in using new words and bringing in their experiences from other organizations. And so Jack mentioned our eight cultural anchors. Our eight cultural anchors are the foundation of our communication plan, and all of those eight cultural anchors are words that our then new CEO, Mike Ball, was using as he went about the job of leading at Hospira. So he came in talking about accountability and responsibility, so that became one of our eight cultural anchors. He also came in not only talking about, but actually role modeling direct and authentic communication, and that became one of our eight cultural anchors. So we were so fortunate to have a great communicator in Mike, someone that was using words that we could grasp, that we could put, make part of our eight cultural anchors so that we had a foundation to start communicating with our employees. But obviously it's not just Mike who needs to be authentic in his communication, all of our leaders have to be able to talk about these eight cultural anchors. And so we purposefully did not define them. We did not put definitions on our company intranet site. We simply created the anchors, we created icons, we created images, uh, we created the words, but every leader needs to understand what customer centricity is to them. Customer centricity, another one of our anchors. Every leader needs to be able to say, well, for me and what I do with my internal customers here at Hospira, our customer centricity means X. And by defining it in their own words, they're able to be much more authentic in their delivery and their communication of that anchor. Similarly, one of our anchors is being quality focused. Quality focused means one thing to our quality organization, but it means something else to all of our other organizations that have to be equally fo focused on quality, but it means something slightly different. 
So by putting the eight cultural anchors out there, by not purposefully not defining them, by not giving managers talk notes that say, here's what you need to say about these anchors, we've been encouraging leaders to develop their own voice, their own vocabulary, so that they can be very authentic in how they communicate around these eight cultural anchors. So as I move to talk about the second component, which is integration, you'll see that all of those cultural anchors get integrated into really everything that we're doing in Aspera. So the second principle is that in order for culture transformation to really stick, you have to integrate it into existing processes. It can't be a standalone initiative that, as Jack calls it, is the flavor of the month. Because as soon as people think it's the flavor of the month, they no longer pay attention. So the example that I'm providing here is something called our Cascade Strategy Playbook. And this is something that we created at the beginning of 2013 for the purpose of enabling our leaders and managers to cascade and communicate our strategy throughout the organization. So that every Hasperian was very clear on what he or she did that contributed to the ultimate success of our business. As we put that Cascade Strategy Playbook together, we realized it was a terrific opportunity to integrate our cultural anchors so that people could understand, if I deliver against these cultural anchors and these cultural behaviors, that's gonna help us be even more successful delivering against our business strategy. So we put it all together. So for example, one of our uh, cultural anchors is focusing on the main thing. So by having a Cascade Strategy book, where everybody understands how he or she connects to that strategy, everyone's able to much more clearly define, well, what is my main thing? What is the thing that I'm doing that's gonna help us be successful as a company? Secondly, it allows people to anticipate the needs of our customers, whether it's internal or external customers, because they're clear about where we're heading. So they're able to anticipate the needs, they're also able to act quickly, be quickly responsive and nimble as things change in our environment. Well, those are two of our cultural anchors, anticipating and being nimble and continuously improving. So the Cascade Strategy Book gives people the tools to be able to anticipate and respond in a nimble fashion as things change. And then the eighth anchor, so that you have all eight of them, is being global and interdependent. And by having a Cascade Strategy Book that was one playbook for the entire company, enterprise-wide, no matter which of the 90 countries you operate within, uh, that, that really reinforces the message that in order for us to be successful as a company, we have to be global and inter interdependent in how we approach our work. So we found that integrating strategy and culture has been very powerful for our, for our leaders. We have a couple quotes here up on the screen from our leaders about how useful this tool was for them. And as we're approaching the end of 2013, we're in the process of continuously improving our approach to the Cascade Strategy Playbook so that we can offer that again in 2014. So the third component of five that I want to talk briefly about is top-down leadership. Um, as I mentioned, Mike has been a great ambassador for our culture transformation. He helped define the words and the terminology. We have many venues of communication for Mike to interact with our employees, both uh, enterprise-wide, all employee communication, as well as small groups and one-on-one -on -one opportunity. But Mike obviously can't do this alone. We need to engage all of our leaders and our leadership teams in driving these messages of culture transformation. They have to be prepared to be aligned around what it is that we're doing, about where we're going as a culture. They have to be prepared to role model the behaviors that we're asking of our employees. They also need to be prepared to really define what are the expectations of our employees as we move into this new world and we move toward this new culture. We also realize that every leader has not been through this experience let alone led a team through an experience of change and transformation or culture transformation. So we couldn't necessarily expect all of them to be ready and able to lead that effort. So we put together a program, a two-day workshop called Making a Difference at Hospira, which we offer to intact teams of leaders and their leadership teams that's designed to help them develop, if they don't already have them, the mindset and the behaviors and the skills that are required to lead this type of culture transformation. And so while it is a culture workshop, 
We integrate leadership development, team building and team effectiveness, and also a deep dive into a couple of our cultural anchors so that when they walk out of this two-day workshop, they're quite clear what their individual role is as a leader in driving change, how important it is how they show up as a leader, how important it is that they maintain a positive mood and energy as they're taking people on what could be a very rough journey of change and transformation. And that as a leadership team, they're all again aligned around where they're going and that their people that are following them see them as a unified leadership voice so that their people are not dividing and conquering, uh, trying to separate them or, 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 or break them up as a leadership team. So we spend a lot of time developing them as a high performing team. And then of course we do focus on the cultural anchors. We chose to focus on two specifically accountability and responsibility, because we believe that that alone can really change the performance of individuals and a company if everyone is personally accountable for the work that they deliver and the commitments that they make. So we spend an entire half day defining what personal accountability is, what it looks like, and maybe most importantly, helping leaders understand or develop some tools and some skills to develop personal accountability um, on their team. So we spend a lot of time on personal accountability and we also spend a significant portion of time talking about the main thing. Again, the belief being that if people are clear and focused about what they're working on or their main thing, we have a much higher probability of actually achieving our business objectives. So we designed that program last summer. We launched it actually almost exactly a year ago, October 31st of 2012. We rolled it out enterprise-wide. We have uh, had almost 2,000 leaders and managers go through the program at all of our pharma plants, our device plants, our corporate leadership teams in every one of our regions. And, it's, it's, and I'll talk about this when I highlight at the end some of the, uh, I think, critical success factors. But the ability to quickly roll out programs of this nature when you're trying to transform culture I think is critically important because it's about getting to a tipping point where everybody is speaking the same language, everybody understands what you mean when you talk about accountability and responsibility. Um, there's certain language that we use in the workshop that leaders then go out and use with their teams. And so it's important that that language gets out there to all employees quickly. So the fact that we've been able to quickly move and launch this program internally, I think has been critically important. The fourth piece though is about bottom-up engagement because Mike can't do it alone, the leadership teams can't do it alone. We would not be driving culture change at Hospira if we weren't engaging the hearts and minds of all of our employees. And so the fourth piece is really about bottom-up engagement, making sure that we're engaging all employees in this process. So that starts with being clear and communicating effectively with them. It starts with having great leaders who are helping them understand the vision and where we're going and how we're gonna get there and coaching them through it. Uh, but it also just involves them deciding and making choices every day that they're gonna get up and come in and help us move in the direction that we're trying to head as a company. And so we have a number of uh, programs. I was gonna highlight a, a couple quickly. One is one that I actually spoke about at this exact conference last year, which is called the Ignite Grant. Uh, we have a, a program called the Ignite Grant, which is an opportunity for employees, teams of employees to apply for up to 5,000 US dollars in um, learning, for a learning program. And it uh, allows teams to identify what their own learning needs are because I cannot possibly know what somebody sitting in Dubai needs in order to be more effective in his or her job. So they determine what they need to be effective. They put together an application, they submit the application, they talk about a return on investment, they find the provider of that learning service or program, and it's a competitive process. And every year for the last four years, we've been able to award about 40 Ignite grants uh, and we get about 200 applications. So a very, um, a very competitive process, but one that's been very well received by our employees. Now, that program was designed four years ago before we had cultural anchors. But the reason why I bring it up is because it's, again, about integration. And the Ignite Grant is a program that asks employees to take personal accountability for understanding what their development needs are. So it reinforces that anchor of accountable and responsible. 
and it also asks them to think about what they need to be successful so that they continue to improve and evolve in their position so that they can have an impact and make a difference. And again, one of our cultural anchors is continuously improving. So while we created the program before we had the cultural anchors, we do, um, we do reinforce through the program that we are continuing to look for our employees to be personally accountable for their own learning and their own development. A more recent example, maybe a little bit more fun, is something called the Hasby Awards. And the Hasby Awards are an award program that was created by employees at our plant in McPherson, Kansas. It wasn't something that we incorporated, it wasn't one of our brilliant ideas. They came up with this Hasby Award, which honors and recognizes people for delivering against our cultural anchors and for exhibiting the behaviors that we're looking for. And it's a big shindig where people get dressed up and they create their own little statuettes and they invite families and they make a big uh, recognition ceremony out of it to honor the people that are exhibiting the cultural behaviors we're looking for. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to support and encourage and the kind of engagement that we're looking for from our employees as we move down this journey of culture transformation. And the fifth piece ties right into that, which is reward and recognition. So what they came up with was a great idea to reward and recognize people that are living <coughs> in culture, that are embodying the cultural behaviors that we're looking for. We recognize that reward and recognition is critically important to reinforce the behaviors that we're looking for. That positive reinforcement <coughs> goes a long way. So we've done things both big and small. In 2013, we actually changed our annual incentive plan, our annual bonus plan, so that's a big change, that now incorporates an individual modifier for people who perform above and beyond. Historically, your annual bonus as an individual was based upon the performance of the company and or your business unit, but now with this individual modifier, if you are delivering greater value than someone else sitting on the team, you are gonna be recognized through your bonus program. So again, reinforcing this notion of accountability and responsibility. On a smaller scale, we instituted something called the Making a Difference at Hospira program, which allows any employee to award any other employee a certificate for their making a difference, for them driving culture, for them exhibiting the desired cultural behaviors. And I had, didn't check before coming here, I checked uh, back in June or July, mid-year. At the mid-year point, we had, we had about 1,400 of those Making a Difference awards. So if we kept up at the same clip, we're probably at 2,500 or 3,000 going toward year end, where people took the time to fill out a certificate and give it to another member of their team or someone with whom they interact to recognize them for their contribution. They're also able to attach a $25 to $250 gift card to that Making a Difference Award. And that's something that we see people recognizing their teammates at staff meetings, in small group public settings. It's something that really means a lot to people. But again, that whole piece of reward and recognition is critically important, I think, to sustaining the behaviors that you're looking for in a culture transformation. So if I look back over the last 12 to 18 months, and some things we did well because we were smart, and other things we did well because we were lucky, um, there are certain, I think, key success factors that I look back on, and we're still in the process. It's still ongoing. But I think there were a few things that um, have been important or success factors in trying to engage and embed um, people around these culture, this culture transformation. And I've spoken about all of them briefly. I'll recap them here. One is integration of the anchors into every, everyday activities and communications. I think if you don't integrate through things like the Ignite Grant, through things like the Cascade Strategy Playbook, it will absolutely become a flavor of the month and they'll say, oh, there's eight more things that those people in corporate are telling me about and they're not gonna take them seriously. But when they start showing up in performance management, and in Cascade Strategy Playbooks and in your reward systems, all of a sudden people recognize that these are things that are actually might, maybe gonna stay around, which relates to number two, having those systemic changes that support your um, culture transformation. So whether it's modifying your performance expectations to build in those anchors or rewarding them, as we did in our change to our HIP program, our annual incentive program, those are the things that you need to do in order to make these kinds of changes stick. The third piece is all about the senior leadership team supporting and role modeling the behaviors and equipping them to do it. So if they don't know how, then 
create some kind of development opportunity so that they're able to take an active role in leading these efforts. Broadening the engagement of leaders at every level, as I mentioned, engaging all employees I think is critically important. And then finally, the internal development of the anchors and the communications and the programming. And that was the, the, the title for this presentation was that we did this from within. And we made a conscious choice that we wanted to develop our own anchors, we wanted to use our own language, we wanted to design our own programs. And someone actually asked me at lunch, well, why did, why did you do that? <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a brilliant question. And when I think about why we did it, it's because one, we recognized that there were some cost savings to be achieved by doing it internally. And if we were gonna sustain these activities, we couldn't do things that required pricey consultants coming back again and again and again. And two, I think we had a fundamental belief that culture is something that you should build from within. That it, it should be in your own voice, in your own language, and feel like a Hasbira program and not something that got bought off the shelf from some consultant. If I look quickly at some potential barriers, and these are ones that in some cases we've experienced and tried to overcome, clearly resistance to change is always a barrier. Where uh, a, a, a spin-off, as Jack mentioned from Abbott Laboratories, we have a very long history, we have a lot of legacy practices, people that have worked at Abbott slash Hospira for 25, 30, 35 years, so you always have to deal with the legacy culture and the legacy practices. I think number two, this is not easy, and it takes time, and leaders have to develop, and they have to take time focusing on their development. They have to take time focusing on their team development to be more high-performing to drive these types of cultural initiatives. And so, frankly, getting leaders to commit to a two-day offsite to do the Making a Difference program sometimes was challenging. I have to say that over the years we've progressed, it's become less challenging because the word of mouth on the program is how terrific it is and how much the leaders get from it. And those that try to cut it back to a day or a day and a half come back saying, I wish I'd spent the full two days because it was a really terrific experience. Third, ensuring the messages are penetrating at every level. I've talked a lot about communication, but it's not enough for people in the C-suite to know this is going on. Everybody needs to know what's going on and the communication needs to be translated so that it is relevant to every person in the company. And finally, as I mentioned, rolling out the uh, communications and programming quickly to, enough to hit that tipping point. So as I reflect, those were some success factors and some potential barriers for success. If this is something that you're thinking about doing, I share that with you.